Good morning and welcome everybody to the Audit and Risk uh, Committee of the 27th of September. Uh, I'd like to specifically welcome all the members and officers and in particular I'd like to welcome uh, Carol Batchelor and Michael Wilkie from KPMG who are the external auditors. Um, now for proceedings today, can I remember officers and councillors in the chamber and online to use the chat box to attract my attention? Um, as as per normal. Okay. Now, can I ask if there's been any apologies? Uh, yes, convener. We have apologies from Councillor Braun and Councillor McCall with Councillor Frampton substituting. Um, in the chambers this morning, we have Councillor Chan, Councillor Harvey, Councillor Ellingworth. Councillor McPherson and Councillor Colin Stewart. For those joining us online, when I call out your name, if you could please confirm you're present. Councillor Liz Barrett. Present. Councillor Frampton. Present. Councillor Kigali. Yep, I'm here. And Councillor Grant Stewart. Present. Thank you. All members are present, convener. And are there any declarations of interest? Could you just put a quick DI in, in the comment? OK, happy. And can we agree the Audit and Risk Committee minutes of the meeting of the 28th of June? Great, Great thank you very much. And can we uh, have a okay? And can we note the outstanding business statement that's in the, the papers that have been provided? Noted. Agreed. Okay, thank you. That's agreed. Okay, we move on to the draft audited accounts for 21-22 for a Perth and Kinross Council. Uh, can I ask Mr McKenzie to introduce the report? Thank you, convener, and good morning, councillors. Can I just check for everyone online can hear me? OK, thank you. Thank you very much. The committee has requested to approve the 2021-22 draft on audited annual accounts for signing to give a letter of representation and to note the contents of KPMG's draft annual report to the members of Perth and Ross Council and the control of audit for the year ended 31st of March 2022. The Council's accounts remain largely unchanged from those approved by the committee on the 28th of June. As highlighted in the auditor's report, two audit differences were identified, one relating to a disclosure note which has been corrected and one relating to a judgmental difference which has not been adjusted. Excuse me. Neither impact upon the level of resources available to the Council and the Council's uncommitted general fund reserves as at the 31st of March 2022 are approximately £16.6 .6 million pounds, or 3.8% of budgeted net expenditure. Members will appreciate that the scope of the audit is more than just the accuracy of the financial statements. In the wider scope and best value section of the auditor's report includes an assessment of the Council's arrangements for financial management, financial sustainability, governance and transparency, and value for money. <clears throat> Following approval by the committee, I would also propose to report to the Council on the accounts prior to the end of the year. Throughout the appointment, we have benefit benefited from early and constructive engagement with our external auditors, and I would thank Mr Wilkie and his team for their pos this positive approach. As a result, both the accounts and audit have been completed within normal timescales. This is not the experience in every council and helps free up officer time to focus on the management of this year's budget and the financial challenges ahead. I would also take this opportunity to thank both my own team and colleagues from across the council for their support in the preparation and audit of the council's accounts and to Alison O'Brien and Scott Walker for the leadership of this exercise. Colleagues are now happy to take questions, convener, but I expect that the committee will be keen to hear from our auditors on their annual report. Thank you. Um, Ms. Uh, 
Thank you, Ms McKenzie. Mr Wilkie, would you be able to uh, introduce your report, please? Thank you. This is our draft annual audit report and I am the audit director responsible for delivery of the external audit and ultimately issuing an opinion. It remains as draft until after I've issued that opinion, at which point it would be finalised and is in respect of the year which ended in March 2022. That is the sixth and final year of our appointment as the Council's external auditor following a competitive tender process and thanks to management really for their support um, and response to our audit challenge throughout the period of our appointment. It's been a constructive relationship. I won't um, speak to every page in our report uh, at all, but just highlight a few key aspects. Within your document pack, page 137 summarises key aspects of my proposed conclusions, mainly that I expect to issue an unqualified opinion on the Council's accounts and there are no matters that I need to report to you by exception. And similarly, I expect to be able to issue an unqualified opinion on the charities accounts, which are com uh, comprised at the same time and within the overall accounts pack. There is one adjusted audit misstatement that's in respect of a capital commitment disclosure and one unadjusted misstatement that's not made but is below our materiality level. Therefore, I'm content that management do not have to make it and that will not have an impact on the opinion that I intend to issue. As a reminder, I carry out the audit to a specified level of materiality. That's around £10 million and that determines the extent of testing and the level of work which we carry out in order to detect misstatements which could potentially either individually or in aggregate exceed that threshold. The main body of the report between pages 139 and 145 set out the significant risks and other audit focus areas that featured within this year's audit, the approach to them and the conclusions in each. The key aspects to tell members are that the two presumed risks which exist in any audit around fraud risk from management's ability to override controls and the fraud risk that management are able to manipulate either income or expenditure recognition were both accepted by us and um, for the most part in the audit um, and there were no matters to bring back to your attention. The next aspect of significant risk is in respect to revaluation of property plant and equipment and we use our own KPMG valuer to support the audit team's ability to challenge management and the council's valuer in respect of those valuations. We highlight a number of positive conclusions, including in respect of the exercises that management carried out specifically in response to our recommendations in previous years. That's around roll forward evaluations and considering assets that haven't been revalued in the current year. But in respect of the valuation of schools in particular, which was carried out this year, we did challenge management on respect of the fact that there was no apparent deduction for the most part in respect of certain aspects of external works around those schools. So that's things like car parks, fences, groundworks, and things ancillary to the building or land itself. These assets are carried at depreciated replacement cost, which effectively means a, a current replacement cost which against which some allowance is made for obsolescence. And in the majority of schools, there was no allowance being made for obsolescence in those external works. As a result of our challenge, management supported by their value are estimated that an appropriate reduction may be £6.8 million if it was to be made and we are satisfied that as that's below our materiality it can remain as an unadjusted and judgmental difference in respect to valuations. The second significant risk is in respect of the valuation of pension liabilities driven by the level of judgment and the fact that small changes in pension assumptions can give rise to very large material changes in the numbers in the accounts. Again we use our own pension specialists to support the audit in that area and overall, we're satisfied with the accounting for pensions and that the assumptions selected by management and the council are balanced overall when benchmarked against our expectations. Just a couple of other aspects I would um, highlight, and these relate to some of the recommendations which are within our report. On page 150, we highlight a matter that arose regarding accounting for infrastructure assets. That's a sector wide issue which came to light um, relatively towards the end of the audit process affecting local authorities throughout the UK in which it was identified that there was a general um, inability for most local authorities to correctly account for infrastructure assets in compliance with uh, certain accounting requirements. In short, that they had insufficient detail in respect of infrastructure assets, things like roads, to be able to effectively 
dispose of elements when they are replaced. The risk therefore being that assets were added continuously to the accounts but never disposed, so you had a potential overstatement in the accounts. To remedy that, the Scottish Government permitted two different statutory overrides um, to address two different potential uh, misstatements in the accounts in effect. And the Council has elected to use both overrides, disclose that as required within the accounts and made amendment to the accounts to take advantage of those overrides. The result being that it mitigates the risk that otherwise would have existed of a qualified audit opinion. And as a result of that potential for a qualified audit opinion, in the absence of the Scottish Government's override, we've made a Grade 1 recommendation um, effectively that management continue to remain alert to the issue and the sector response to it. The statutory override currently runs until March 2024, but all other things being equal, if neither the accounting records can be enhanced by that point or some sector-wide um, change to the accounting requirements put in place, then the risk of qualified opinion would otherwise return. Even if um, some other remedy is put in place, that remedy could require significant um, management and operational time to implement and be particularly challenging, difficult and difficult. So either way, and that's why we consider it to be a, a higher graded recommendation. The second recommendation I would highlight um, stems from page 165 in the report and effectively highlights that the importance of management's ability to be able to demonstrate best value in the use of funds and that's particularly in the context of capital projects and the significant uh, number, nature and value of projects that the Council enters into, particularly given current uh, rising construction costs in general and competing pressures um, on Council resources. We highlight therefore a number of aspects but in essence it's to remain alert to the appropriateness and sufficiency of governance around all aspects of major capital projects, including selection of projects, uh, allocation of resources to them, clear identification of the objectives to be obtained uh, from those projects and how it aligns with the Council's priorities, and then all aspects of delivery from procurement through to risk management. There's a number of other um, confirmations within our report, including our independence, but there's nothing I particularly need to highlight to members. So. I will pause there and take questions. Okay, uh, I see on the chat that Liz, uh, Councillor Barrett would like to make a, a question. Thank you, Convener. Um, my questions are for the finance team to confirm what action is being taken in relation to some of the items in the audit report. Um, the preparation for expiry in March 2024 for the, of the statutory override relating to the componentization of infrastructure assets for disposal of elements being replaced, that's on page 40 and 172, uh, which Michael's just referred to. Um, just to ask what preparation is being done for that. Um, I also appreciate that it's below the audit materiality level, but um, the unadjusted audit difference of 6.8 million about the additional obsolescence for external works areas. Um, we understand from the auditors that you are intending to do something about that and I just wondered if you could confirm. Um, and also on page 33 um, or 165, um, the recommendations, um, I note what's said about capital projects. There's also a recommendation to review all SLEs with ALIOs um, and I just wanted to ask whether action is being taken on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barrett, and um, thank you, Convener. So, a bit of a list here, if I can maybe just address those comments. And Ton, I'm going to ask first for my colleagues to respond on, on your first point, Councillor Barrett, which is the um, uh, component, component, I'm not even going to try and say that, apologies. Infrastructure assets question. Scott Allison, I don't know if there's, is there any comment you wish to add? OK, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, this is very fresh, Councillor Barrett, so we've got, we're keeping a watch and brief on it. We will see what happens nationally. I mean, as, as Mr Wilkie said, this is a UK issue, um, so there will be developments. If there are not developments over the, over the short term, we will have to start um, making arrangements how we comply with this. Um, but we will keep an eye on it and uh, hopefully the mitigation 
that uh, Mr Wilkie mentioned will come out. Thank you, Scott. I'll um, perhaps comment on, on the second issue, which is the um, unadjusted matter within the accounts of £6.8 million. Pounds. Again, that, that came up fairly late in the accounts process, and as Mr Wilkie has, has intimated, it won't impact on his opinion in terms of the accounts. And there was a, a difference of opinion between our own in-house valuers and KPMG's external valuers on the extent of the issue. We, we did some estimation and to correct that at that late stage would have made a number of significant changes to the council's account. So we took a pragmatic view council about, around that um, given the materiality. So rather than trying to the accounts open at the last minute, um, we accepted that, that that issue would appear in the audit report and we discussed it with auditors to ensure there was a common understanding. And then the third point on the SLAs, I think that that's, that's work to be progressed hand in hand, and I think that will also form part of the discussions around the budget, which which Council will will consider um, on Wednesday. Is that helpful? It is, thank you. Um, just on the um, unadjusted audit difference, so you are planning to tackle that before next year then? I think we're live to this, you know. OK, we'll be a, we'll be a different we'll, set we'll, of figures next year, but I think we're yes. alive to the issue. Yes, we, we'll you. look forward to seeing next year's. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Right, thank you. And now is a question from Councillor Grant Stewart. Thank you, convener. Um, I was wanting to ask our officers about these um, from the paper in section nine. Uh, and the point is the 9.1 there was reference made to uh, our cyber resilience and we know about the sensitivities around data and i was wondering if they could inform me about what they mean by robust Apologies, Councillor. Could you perhaps give us a page reference? I think we're maybe struggling to reference the point you're making oh, on the papers. My apologies. Uh, page uh, 39.9.1. About resilience technology and um, cyber resilience. I was just wondering what you're meaning by robust. That systems are fit for purpose and robust. Uh, thank you for your, uh, uh, for the question, Councillor. This uh, this is part of the annual governance statement, which was uh, considered uh, back in June. Um, and uh, just to give a, a bit of an, uh, an, an update to you here, uh, we will we do continue within uh, within uh, the team of information security specialists within legal and governance services. Uh, to review um, our our position, uh, we've augmented the team with uh, with a, a, a trainee to provide us with greater opportunities for reviewing our resilience and our information governance arrangements. That's part and parcel of uh, of of the arrangements that we put in place, which will help to to protect the council and to ensure that that what we have in place is fit for purpose. When you talk about robust. We do compare ourselves with other um, public sector organisations, with a view to ensuring that we're uh, we are uh, achieving what we can within the resources that are permitted, uh, but that actually protects our organisation and our um, infrastructure assets as well, um, our IT infrastructure assets. Thank you very much. 
And now I've got a question from Councillor Colin Stewart. Um, thanks, convener. Um, maybe, maybe two questions. Um, so, firstly, on page thirty-nine of our papers, page eighteen of the accounts, um, section eight point one, just above where we were just looking at the opinion of the chief internal auditor. Um, uh, in the chief auditor's opinion, reasonable reliance can be placed on the council's risk management and governance arrangements. Can I ask what the possible range of um, reliance is? Is there are, are there levels higher than reasonable reliance? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, there is one above reasonable, um, which is substantial. Um, uh, but there are also a number which are lower than reasonable. Uh, reasonable is what I would expect to be able to, to provide. One of the reasons why I wouldn't be able to give a substantial opinion is due to the uh, level of coverage that we're able to undertake across all systems. Uh, we undertake a risk-based internal audit uh, programme, um, but, uh, but we, we don't cover the whole of the organisation every year. So within within the year from the review that I undertake through my team um, in, as part of the audit planning process, um, uh, but also other reviews such as through the annual governance statement process and evidence, um, I uh, arrive at the uh, the reasonable reliance, uh, which is uh, which is it's not as good as it gets, but it's it. it that, that's what we would hope for. It's like an it's, it's like an unqualified opinion from an external audit, reasonable reliance. Thank you. So it's 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 around the issue of resource to do more auditing and gain a higher level of assurance. Thank you. If uh, if we had significant more resources, and it would be significant for me to be in a position uh, to to go in anything above reasonable. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the next uh, question, um, I think, is uh, for uh, Mr. Wilkie or, or KPMG, um, and it's on page 172 of our papers. Page. Um, 40 of the um, uh, report um, and it relates to the significant capital projects um, and the response um, in relation to that is that project governance arrangements are in place for significant capital projects including the CTLR. Um, obviously you've identified um, there that um, the estimated costs for the project have been revised upwards by £32.5 million. Pounds. Um, I wonder if you could comment on whether you think those the project governance arrangements in place for significant capital projects are sufficient given that the £32.5 million pound revised upward cost um, was the first revision since the project was initially costed um, with optimism bias in place in 2016. Firstly, we haven't specifically re reviewed project governance for the Cross Tay Link Road, um, so I, I couldn't speak to that specific circumstance. We have looked at capital project governance in general um, in the current year and previous years and didn't have any specific deficiencies. But we do highlight here effectively that the risk continues to increase, particularly because of fluctuations in costs in the current environment, and that increases the need for probably more regular and more transparent scrutiny of all aspects of capital projects. And that's regardless of which stage they're at. So we cite two effectively within the report, CTLR and PH2O, both at quite different stages in their project life cycle but both equally important in terms of continued focus. From discussions with um, officers, I don't have any particular concerns that it won't be in place. Um, I just highlight the importance of demonstrating it going forward. OK, thank you. 
Okay, and we've got another question from Councillor Barrett. Thank you. Um, just a quick question for the auditors. Um, it's about, oh, I've lost it. Sorry, hang on, give me a sec. Um, page 47, which is 179 in the pack. Um, are there any exceptions? I think the answer to this is no, but I just wanted to check. Um, are there any exceptions arising from the testing on grant claims and whole government accounts return in Appendix 7? We were not required to audit the whole of government account return for the current year as a result of COVID. Effectively, the threshold for audit was increased and therefore we have not tested whole of government accounts. Uh, at the time of drafting, um, we've yet to complete our work in respect of uh, non-domestic rates and housing benefits. So I couldn't comment, although nothing's come out as an exception to date. And uh, the EMA return education maintenance allowance equally did not require an audit for 2022 as a result of COVID. So not, nothing that's come to date. That, that was it. It was just you'd, you'd said you would update us if there were any exceptions arising from the testing. And my assumption was that there weren't, but I just wanted to check. Thank you. Okay, are, are there any more questions? Okay, I'd, I'd like to ans ask a, a question. It, it's about the substantial recommendation. This is extremely unusual for this council to have a substantial recommendation uh, and indeed over the years you've uh, audited us that there has been no substantial recommendations. Um, does this recommendation reflect poorly on our management in any way? It's not a specific reflection on the council itself, it's a sector wide issue um, which I would expect to impact the majority if not all um, local authorities to some extent so it's not a reflection in respect of practice. I think the, the point it being that the practice is being consistent across most local authorities but not sufficient to meet the accounting requirements. And does this uh, recommendation have any impact at all on the smooth running of Perth and Kinross Council? And that does it uh, also question also applies to the obsolescence uh, uh, issue with the 6.8 million? Neither of them are um, in respect of operational matters, and therefore wouldn't, I, ex I wouldn't expect them to impact the delivery of council services. They both relate to accounting requirements and presentation of the financial statements. Great, thank you for that. And in the absence of any other uh, questions, I'd like to make a few, a few comments, if I may. In 2017, the Highland village of Dull um, twinned with the villages of Boring and Bland. And, and I had hoped that this would be another Bland, Boring and Dull report with no significant issues to report. Uh, however, I'm delighted to hear that the significant issues and the issues um, neither reflect poorly on our management who are excellent and neither have any significant or any operational impact on the running of the council. Uh, I think I'm extremely pleased to well it extremely pleased to hear of the good reputation of the external auditors of our managers. Uh, I, you know, I have to confess I don't fully understand the accounts as a non-accountant and it's a highly technical and I depend on, and I'm sure we all do, on the external uh, auditors for their opinion. Uh, I'm also uh, sad that we're going to be missing the services of KPMG. Who have, this is the fifth time they've they've appeared before me as the longest member of this committee, and I'd like to thank them for their, their services and their commitment, and for their ability to build extremely good good working relationships with our managers. And so, one after that comment, are, are there any other comments that people would like to make? Liz Barrett would like to make a comment. Sorry, Councillor Barrett would like to make a comment. Thank you, Convener. Um, these accounts are now historic, but they do highlight many of the challenges that are facing us. 
um, including last week's announcements from the UK government not addressing the impacts on the most vulnerable in our community of the increase in the cost of living and energy prices. The announcements have also increased pressure on those in receipt of benefits, many of whom are single parents with children living in poverty. This failure will in turn add to the pressures on impl implementation of our transformation and change blah, transformation and change strategy. I'm not the only one who can't speak this morning, referred to in section eight of the management commentary to the accounts and the hard decisions we'll need to make to protect those most in need in our communities and our key services and to balance the council's budgets going forward. I'd like to congratulate the finance team and particularly Stuart McKenzie as head of finance, Scott Walker, chief accountant, Alison O'Brien, the corporate accounting manager and the finance uh, and the rest of the finance team for the commendations on page five of the audit report, recognising their diligence in preparing the accounts and, and the focus of accuracy of attention to detail. I'd also like to highlight the recognition of the high quality of the working papers, the robust control environment and the favourable rate of return achieved on cash and short term investments. There are a lot of good things about our finance team buried in among the detail of these accounts and I commend them for it. Thanks to everyone in the team and to Jackie Clark as Chief Internal Auditor for the preparation of the accounts and all your work with KPMG to respond to the audit. And I'd also I'd like to add my thanks to Michael Wilkie and the team at KPMG for your years of service to KPC, PKC even. Oh, hopeless. That's enough. Thank you. Bye. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if the managers would like to respond to these comments. Thank you, convener. Just, just to thank um, Councillor Barrett for very generous uh, comments there. Uh, and, and just Perhaps, um, as 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 members will be aware, the gift of, of audit appointment does not rest to the council. But I can only express my thanks over an extended period to Mr. Wilkie and his team for a very positive approach and very early engagement. We've been clear um, from the outset what the expectations are. That makes a huge difference in terms of planning for the audit, particularly over extraordinary circumstances that we've seen over the last two years, where both we've had to adjust. And in fairness, uh, our external auditors have had to adjust. Um, I find all of that quite a, a, a useful, personally, a useful learning experience. I think um, we've had an opportunity to, to have some challenge um, and some discussion. That's been a very constructive relationship and I'm grateful for it. And I think that um, that has very much facilitated getting us to where we are. As I noted, not all local authorities are in a position to report on normal timescales. That does take a bit of a pressure off because as is plenty for your finance seem to be doing so. Thank you to Mr. Mulkey and his team. Thank right. you. Um, oh, no, thank you. It's it's been a it's been a pleasure. Um, as you say, we've worked um, constructively together with um, challenge. I think throughout the years, but always done proactively, and that's enabled us to conclude on time. Uh, so, are th are there any more other comments? Is committee uh, content to note this report? Noted. Great, right, thank you very much. That, that brings this, this, uh, this part of the committee to an end.